notwithstanding the best efforts by Lenin and Trotsky and their state socialist heirs to erase any trace of it from history. How can this be? From what perspective and in what senses might the Kronstadt revolt be understood as a living revolutionary utopia? That's the point I'd, I'd like to start with. To formulate an initial answer to this question, I refer to Walter Benjamin's uh, theses on the concept of history, the manuscript of which was written in the spring of 1940 and later recovered by Hannah Arendt from among his belongings following his suicide during his attempt to flee from the, from the Nazis. Throughout the theses, Benjamin contrasts two very different ways of understanding history. First, narratives of progress that glorify power in the name of civilization and modernity. And second, an, an historical materialist perspective that, quote, brushes history against the grain. This is in thesis seven. He illuminates this contrast chiefly by means of several arresting allegorical images. Thesis seven, for example, conjures the image, particularly resonant in the Jewish tradition, of the triumphal procession in which the victors of history march over the prostate bodies of their victims, the cultural spoils of war hold, held high above their heads. In what amounts to a direct challenge to the cultural ba barbarism binary that is one of the hallmarks of the idea of progress inherited from the Enlightenment and which still structures so much of Western thought, Benjamin maintains that there is no document of culture which is not at the same time a document of barbarism understood in the sense of extreme cruelty or brutality. In stark contrast to those historians who celebrate history's victors and thus legitimate existing configurations of power, Benjamin's admittedly rather unorthodox historical materialist perspective interprets history from below, from the perspective of those crushed under the wheels of progress, modernity, and civilization. The key, I think, to understanding Benjamin's revolutionary philosophy of history lies in his messianic conception of time. Drawing deeply on the well of theology and particularly Jewish messianism, Benjamin contrasts empty homogeneous time to what he terms jedzeit or explosive time filled by the presence of the now. Far from being merely a temporally isolated moment in which the present is understood simply as a way station, a transition to the future, Jedzeit signifies a rupture in the homogeneous course of history. It is a rupture enabled by the arresting, historically materialist perception of a unique constellation formed by the juxtaposition of past and present. And it's realized in revolutionary action. Remembrance in this simultaneously messianic and materialist sense is also redemptive. For while it's, while it's true that the dead cannot be awakened and what is destroyed made whole, martyrs of Kronstadt 1921, Barcelona 1937, and countless other so-called third revolutions are gone and their suffering, suffering cannot be in some way extirpated from history, those living in the present may make reparations, tikkun olam in Hebrew, for the suffering inflicted on the defeated of history by accomplishing the socially utopian objectives that they struggled for and failed to obtain. Utopia in Benjamin's schema is thus not something for us waiting at the end of history in the form of a telos, as it is in so many Marxist conceptions, 
including the Bolshevik utopia. Rather, it's an ever-present or weak messianic power inherent in the revolutionary praxis of now time. In political terms and drawing critically on Benjamin's philosophy, we may understand utopian possibilities as anarchistically um, as fragments from the past, which embody the afterlives, echoing the title of our panel, the afterlives of revolutionary dreams and aspirations. It follows that a key task for revolutionary politics is to reactivate the energies buried in those fragments by bringing them into contact with the struggles of the present. From a libertarian socialist perspective, the English socialist William Morris expressed in literary form a very similar, at once revolutionary and redemptive philosophy of history in his uh, prose romance, A Dream of John Ball, published in 1888, a few years before the publication of his socialist utopia, News from Nowhere. This philosophy, informed by Morris's hands-on experience as a socialist organizer, is encapsulated in the beautiful, if unfortunately gendered words, quote, I pondered all these things and how men fight and lose the battle and the thing they fought for comes about in spite of their defeat. And it, when it comes, turns out not to be what they meant and other men have to fight for what they meant under another name, end quote. And from an anarcho-communist perspective, the philosopher and social revolutionary Gustav Landauer in his work, The Revolution, published in 1907, firmly rejects the temporal supposition inherent in culturally dominant ideologies of progress, that the past is nothing more than a way station to the fleeting present in a homo homo homogeneous linear temporality. In Landauer's revolutionary philosophy of history, the past itself is future. It is never finished. Rather, and paradoxically, it, and not only our perceptions of it, changes and modifies as we move ahead. Viewed through the prism of such unorthodox anarchic philosophies of history, we may interpret the events of Kronstadt of 100 years ago very differently from those bourgeois and Soviet historians alike who have in effect glorified power in the name of progress and modernity. Rather than viewing the events of March 1921 in the light of the victorious procession of subsequent events, namely the rise and decline of the Soviet empire, we may instead conceive of them as a series of living presents open to more than one future, as elements, in other words, of a time filled by the presence of the now. If we remember and honor Kronstadt 1921 in this way, then we can measure the distance that separates us from it, not as a relation of cause to effect, but as a relation of our present to the unrealized revolutionary promises and aspirations that it released. As one of the revolutionary pamphlets of May 1968 had it, facts, however time-honored, quote, never have the last word. A radical change in the present is enough to make them topple off their pedestals and fall at our feet, end quote. The Kronstadt Revolt, the Spanish Revolution of the 1930s, May 1968, these are all revolutionary utopias that live on in the struggles, our struggles of the present. More substantively, and with specific reference to the suffocated popular dreams and aspirations of the Russian Revolution that the sailors, soldiers, and civilians of Kronstadt laid down their lives fighting to preserve, let us recall with the historian Richard Stites that the Russian Revolution took on its main spiritual 
mental and expressive forms from the collision and collusion of three major utopian traditions in Russian history, those of the people, those of the state, and those of the radical intelligentsia. In the momentous events of 1917, revolutionary fighters became rulers animated by the Bolshevik dream of an urban industrial order of modernity and productivity combined with justice and armed against competing dreams of the people and the old intelligentsia. In the ensuing Russian civil war, the historical struggle between populism and Marxism that had dominated so much of Russian intellectual history was transformed into a more complicated and active or hot war between the Bolsheviks on the one hand and a wide range of peasants, workers, sailors, and intellectuals associated with peasant disobedience and anarchist freedom on the other. The administrative utopia of the governing Bolsheviks was what we might term a transcendent utopia, a utopia weaponized in the service of power in which the few arrange the lives of others in a hierarchical, regimented, and brutally disciplinary order. This vision was epitomized in Lenin's vanguardist conception of the revolution and in his opportunistic use of state power to reconquer Russia from the autonomous forces that had seized local power in the revolution. In contrast, the rebels of Kronstadt rejected top-down state and party control. They organized democratically and they made equal sharing and solidarity an operative social ideology. Like their great revolutionary forebears, the sans culottes of Paris in 1793, they demanded a third revolution that would reignite the radical democratic and egalitarian impulses or promises that had animated the first. Tragically, this destructive pattern of popular revolution, top-down party and state reconquest and consolidation of power and abortive third revolution would repeat itself throughout the 20th century, giving rise to the popular misconception that all social revolutions are necessarily doomed to failure, the cynicism about revolution which uh, predominates. From a more critical perspective, we who care deeply about the future revolution are faced with a series of difficult questions. Among them, first, how might this cycle of revolutionary betrayal be interrupted or broken? Second, what role can anarchist revolutionary theory and practice play in this process? Third, what are the revolutionary blind spots of anarchist ideology? And how might we learn from the past in order to overcome them? For example, is power a problem in anarchist ideology? And why, as Martha Acklesberg has argued persuasively, in the context of the Spanish Revolution, which Danny will be speaking about, have women and gender and sexual non-conforming people so often been marginalized in even anarchist-inspired social revolutions, with the predictable consequence that once the initial flurry of revolutionary activity had passed, many pre-existing societal values governing gender and sexuality and women's sexuality in particular were allowed to continue intact. And fourth, how might we begin to reimagine revolution in the changed circumstances of the present, particularly in the context of catastrophic climate change, the existential challenge of the collapse of the biosphere and the sixth mass extinction? These are perhaps some of the questions we can consider in this panel on the afterlives of Kronstadt. And so without further ado, I'm pleased, very pleased to introduce the first of our four speakers, Mike Harris.
Mike has been a dedicated anarcho-syndicalist and libertarian worker activist since the 1970s. He's a former factory and warehouse worker and a founding member of the Anarchist Communist Federation of North America, the Libertarian Workers Group, and the Workers Solidarity Alliance. His paper today is entitled In the Spirit of Kronstadt. Mike. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to share this electronic stage with the other co-presenters. Thus far, it's been an excellent and informative conference. In thinking about Kronstadt and all the movements for social change, I believe the old libertarian socialist group, London Solidarity, put it best in their 1967 preface to Ida Metz, the Kronstadt Commune. They laid out that most histories written by radicals are those trying to score a point for their party or for their leaders. As they wrote, the masses never appear independently on the historical stage, making their own history. At best, they only supply the steam, enabling others to drive the locomotive, as Stalin so delicately put it. For me and others, the main contribution of the Russian workers, citizens, peasants, were being the guiding forces in the struggle and in the constructive phase of the revolution. They alone are really the steam, the engine, and the engineer rolled into one. And there is no doubt that revolutionary advances are never made without the daily toil of those directly engaged. It is clear to me and others, a revolution must be constructive or it will doom itself to failure. Of course, there are many aspects of revolution. In this short presentation, I will touch upon two aspects because they still retain importance, housing and the workplace, the struggle for housing. In Petrograd, as elsewhere, the revolutionary struggle took on all forms of injustices and sought to immediately provide relief to the citizen worker. The well-known Russian anarcho-syndicalist participant, G.P. Maximov, wrote that in the wake of 1917, and I quote, under the influence of the anarcho-syndicalist propaganda, there began in Petrograd a spontaneous process of socialization of housing by the house committees. This extended to entire streets, bringing into existence street committees and block committees when entire blocks were drawn in. It, it spread to other cities. In Kronstadt, it started even earlier than in Petrograd and reached even greater intensity. If, the, if in Petrograd and other cities, dwellings were socialized only on the triumph of the October Revolution, in Kronstadt, similar steps were taken earlier under the influence of Kronstadt and Arco syndicalist Ephraim Yarcha, who was enjoying great popularity in that town and in the face of active resistance of the Bolsheviks. Measures of this kind were carried out in an organized way by the revolutionary workers and sailors throughout the town. The Bolshevik faction left the session of the Kronstadt Soviet in protest against the socialization of dwellings. According to a German writer, Hustus John, the House Committee's tasks were keeping order, defending the house, distributing ration cards, registering tenants, and caring for hygienic conditions in the house and courtyard. These cooperatives relegated the life of the whole building and tried to organize communal kitchens and other dwellings where bourgeois elements still happened to reside. The new house committees of the poor or recently moved in, soldiers or workers often held sway without consideration of age, sex, or former status, all inhabitants took turn keeping watch during the night, clearing away snow and so on. The saying that the basement is now identical to the second floor summarizes the new social situation in the houses. And indeed, equalization was made primary target of the house committees and block committees and so forth. We move on to the struggle for self-management. A key aspect of the revolutionary struggle is the struggle for economic freedom and worker self-management. From the outset, the anarcho syndicalists were clear about it, about what it would take to establish libertarian socialism. In 1917, according to the Petrograd Union of anarcho syndicalist propaganda, the whole, and I quote, the whole expanse 
of Russia is now covered by an intricate network of popular organizations, Soviets of peasants, workers and sailors and soldiers, deputies, industrial unions, factory committees, unions of landless pe peasants, etc., etc. And with each day, the conviction is growing among the toiling masses that only the people themselves, through their own non-party organizations, can accomplish the task of a fundamental social and economic reconstruction. So wrote the Petrograd Union, Lenarko Syndicalist Propaganda. As Maximoff also points out, I quote, the idea of workers' control carried out through the factory committees, an idea that an idea advocated by anarcho syndicalists from the very outset of the revolution, took root among the city workers, gaining such a strong hold on them as to force its acceptance in a distorted form, of course, by the socialist parties. The social democrats and the right social revolutionaries twisted this idea of workers' control into that of state control over industry with the participation of workers leaving enterprises in the hands of the capitalists. As for the Bolsheviks, they were quite vague about the meaning of the term workers' control, leaving it undefined and making it a handy tool for demagogic propaganda, excuse me. The Bolsheviks' concept of workers' control was weak need at best and merely legalized the gains of the committee, uh, the workers' committee movement in Russia that had already been achieved in 1917, since 1917. Afterwards, the state and the party, not the self-governing and independent non-state organizations of citizens, peasants and workers were to rule, to be in charge, to manage and control, the very antithesis of the slogan, all power to the Soviets, and libertarian and grassroots oriented aims, the start of the revolution, the end of the revolutionary, and constructive phase was at its end. In drawing to a close, I thought I'd have met in her 1938 epic pamphlet, the Kronstadt Commune, put her finger on the pulse of the socialist project, the project of yesterday and today. She observed that the great ideological and political discussion between realists and dreamers, between scientific socialists and the revolutionary Lenitsia or open conference was fought out, weapons in hand. It ended in 1921 with the political and military defeat of the dreamers. But Stalin was to prove the whole world that the defeat was also that was the defeat of socialism. The defeat of Kronstadt was the final defeat of what workers and citizens self-management might become. Indeed it was. Finally, 50 years on, I continue to be inspired by the libertarian tendencies of the Russian workers, the her heroic Kronstadt sailors, the Paris Commune, the Spanish collectives, and other struggles for freedom from oppression, for a socialism that is self-managed and libertarian, the creation of a new society from below. It is in their spirit that we carry on the struggle for freedom, and thank you for having me today. Thank you very much, Mike, um, for that fascinating presentation and, and particularly for all the rich historical detail about the constructive aspects of the re revolution from housing to, uh, to the workplace. Our second speaker uh, today is, um, is Danny Evans. Danny teaches history at Liverpool Hope University in the UK and co-hosts a Radical History podcast, ABC with Danny and Jim. He's the author of Revolution and the State, Anarchism and the Spanish Civil War, which was published last year by AK Press. And for those who haven't uh, yet read this book, I would um, recommend it, particularly for its, um, its well-documented analysis of the struggles of radical anarchists within the uh, contested processes of state reconstruction. The title of Danny's paper today is a Spanish Kronstadt question mark, the Barcelona May days of 1937. Danny. Thank you very much, Lawrence. 
So thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this fantastic conference. So um, I'm going to be talking about the Barcelona May Days of 1937, and I'm going to be trying to think about that event in relation to the Kronstadt uprising. So the Barcelona May Days of 1937 were an anarchist-led insurrection which took place nine months into the Spanish Civil War and Revolution. It was coordinated by the defense committees uh, attached to the National Confederation of Labor, the CNT, and the Iberian Anarchist Federation, the FI. And it was intended, this uprising, to reassert working class hegemony, both on the street and in the economy of Catalonia in the face of a governmental offensive, um, the immediate trigger for the rising being a police, an armed police assault on the telephone exchange in the center of um, Barcelona in the Plaza de Catalunya on the 3rd of May. Despite dominating the streets, the anarchists were persuaded to withdraw from the barricades three days after the fighting began. And following this retreat, the state authorities and uh, Stalinist agents intensified their offensive, disarticulating rural collectives, reappropriating property, and jailing thousands of revolutionaries. With a good deal of justice, the Barcelona May Days are referred to as the end point of the Spanish Revolution. And it was for this reason that Vernon Richards, writing in the 1957 edition of Lessons of the Spanish Revolution, wrote, and I quote, that Barcelona in May 1937 was to the Spanish Revolution what Kronstadt 16 years earlier had been to the Russian Revolution. The same comparison was made by the anarchists Jaime Balius and Juan Verde, in um, both uh, uh, veterans of the street fight fighting in Barcelona in reflections written in exile, respectively in France and Venezuela. And the parallels were apparent even at the time. So in the days following the withdrawal from the barricades, the Swiss revolutionaries who had participated in the fighting, Clara and Paul Talman, met to exchange impressions with the Trotskyists Erwin Wolf, uh, Mulan, and Grandito Muniz. So while Muniz and Wolf who had both been absent from Barcelona during the fighting, were optimistic about the possibilities of a revolutionary regroupment emerging from the aftermath of the, the Barcelona May Days. The Talmans saw no reason for such optimism. The May uprising in which we have participated, they said, was the Spanish Kronstadt. In other words, a defeat for the revolution that would prove to be definitive. Naturally, the Talmud's remark left the Trotskyists apoplectic. Grinding his teeth, Muniz declared his interlocutors to be puerile anarchists and clowns. Nevertheless, as a defeat for working class control that represented a point of no return on the trajectory of the counter-revolution, the Talmud's analogy was to prove both prescient and apposite. They would soon have time to reflect on the truth of their position from a Stalinist prison while Moulin and Wolf would be shot within months. Muniz, who survived the civil war, later broke with Trotsky, with Trotskyism, I should say. So in this talk, I want to probe whether this analogy between the, the two events can be taken further by pointing out what strike me as some of the major similarities and divergences in the two uprisings. And in the discussion afterwards, I'd be very interested to know what people make of such comparisons and what, if anything, they have to say to us um, decades later. So both the Kronstadt and Barcelona uprisings were attempts to recover the original revolutionary spirit, to begin again. As Ida Met pointed out, the central demand of the Kronstadt insurrection was based on an article of the constitution. And I think that is something that has come across very clearly already at this conference, both in the historian's panel yesterday and also in Mike's um, contribution just now. In Barcelona, the workers set out to save the conquests of July 1936 
in the same way that their Russian cousins had sought to save the conquests of October 1917. In the months prior to the May Days, this desire to return to the point of origin was widely stated at meetings and in the publications and circulars of anarchist organizations. The letter distributed by Alfonso Nieves Munez among the militia on the Andalusian front was typical in this respect and was also um, evocative of the priorities of the Kronstadt sailors. And this is what he said. A new fascism stabs us in the back. We must react against it. A single clamor, freedom for all revolutionary prisoners. If we need to begin again to achieve this, as on the 19th of July, let us begin. When the fighting did break out, the similarities with the first days of street fighting against the military rising were noted everywhere on the revolutionary side. George Orwell recalled a man sheltering in a doorway who jerked his head in the direction of the gunfire and happily said, uh, I quote, as though remarking that it was a fine morning, so we've got the 19th of July back again. In Russia and Spain, the revolution began and ended in the same place. If this was true of location, it was also true of revolutionary organization. Just as the Kronstadt uprising took place through the re-establishment of Soviet power, so the anarchist insurrection at Barcelona was coordinated through the defense committees, who um, Augustine Guillemont's uh, meticulous research has shown, had seen off the military coup in Barcelona and then set about expropriating property overseeing the distribution of food, um, food distribution and supplies, establishing militia columns, and so on. In both cases, these uh, revolutionary organizations had to reclaim their autonomy and freedom of action from their formal leadership. In Kronstadt, this meant a break with the Bolsheviks. In Barcelona, it was affected, di it was affected differently through a revival of the original purpose of the FI as the guarantor of a combative anarchist presence in the labor movement. With the veteran radical Julian Marino taking on the role of secretary of the Barcelona FI from January 1937, a resuscitation of the defense committees was put in motion in such a way that it circumvented the regional as opposed to local committees of the libertarian movement. And this is a photograph of Julian Marino who was crucial in this revival of the defense committees in Barcelona um, and would later play a central role in coordinating the May Day's uprising. This is him in the background here. I'll see if I can zoom. Um, this is a photograph taken from the um, Antonio Teas collection um, housed in the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. And this is a photograph taken in Caracas in 1959, so over 20 years after the events I'm talking about. So 1921 and 1937 saw insurrectionary attempts to put the revolution back on course. In both cases, the revolutionary organizations that were most associated with the revolution had become absorbed into the machinery of the state. However, the comparison can only be taken so far because whereas at Kronstadt a break was made with the institutionalized party, the, the anarchists of Barcelona remained in their organizations, the CNT and the FI, with those coordinating the rising, particularly Marino, gambling on receiving the official support of their regional organizations once the rising had been presented to them as a fait accompli. It could hardly have been otherwise. The beginning and end of the Russian Revolution, as we've just heard, was proletarian democracy, all part of the Soviets. The Bolsheviks were temporary allies in that respect, so they could be dispensed with. In Spain, the revolution was deeply associated with the understanding and imaginary of the anarchist movement and its organizations. Those who rose up in Barcelona in 1937 were the same workers who had debated the post-revolutionary society in their unions and submitted hundreds of resolutions to the CNT's Zaragoza Congress in May 1936, uh, which were eventually synthesized as the organization's collective conception of libertarian communism. Those who rose up then in Barcelona 
in uh, May 1937, considered that the organizations that they belonged to had to be shaken out of their complacency, but they also thought that this had to be done through the organizations themselves. For them, there was no outside. This brings us to another evident difference between the two events, the manner of their suppression. So while the Kronstadt revolt was crushed in open combat, the fighters in Barcelona were ordered to withdraw by the very committee that had coordinated the rising. Its plan for a final assault on police and Stalinist headquarters abandoned. This was possible because Marino had been identified as a member of the committee coordinating the events by Juan García Oliver, the CNT Minister of Justice in the Republican government. At a hastily arranged meeting of influential figures in the movement, it was agreed to augment Marino's committee with four members from the CNT and FI hierarchy. We have to assume that these four additions were sufficient to tip the balance from attack to retreat. In the meantime, uh, Juan García Oliver had consummated his transition from dashing hero of the anarchist, uh, anarchist street to apologist for state reconstruction by pleading for a ceasefire over the radio. Although less bloody, his role evokes Isaac Deutsch's famous portrait of Trotsky when confronted by the conscience of the Russian Revolution in 1921. Quote, what the rebels of Kronstadt demanded was only what Trotsky had promised their elder brothers and what he and the party had been unable to give. Once again, a bitter and hostile echo of his own voice came back to him from the lips of other people. And once again, he had to suppress it. So speaking of Trotsky, another relevant point of comparison between these two events is the way in which the participants were calumniated shamelessly as serving the interests of a common reactionary enemy and how vulgar Marxist stereotypes were applied to the revolutionaries in order to denigrate their consciousness and capacities. Just as Kronstadt was condescendingly referred to as a petty bourgeois rebellion, whose typical partisan was portrayed, and here I'm quoting Averitch, as a corrupt and demoralized roughneck, undisciplined, foul-mouthed, and given to card playing and drink, so were anarchist activists described as uncontrollables, with Stalinist agents associating them with the criminalized and the lumpen. All the thieves, bandits, prostitutes are declaring that they belong to the anarchists, reported Andre Marti to Moscow. The Bolshevik and Stalinist ideologues of 1921 and 1937 drew on the mechanical Marxist assumption that the further away the working class got from their peasant backgrounds, the more wholesome, mature, and conscious they would become, even as the revolutionary processes that contextualize their slanders prove these assumptions wrong. We can now see how easily this mistaken prophecy chimed with the requirement of integrating the working class into the nation state. The crises of 1921 and 1937 were brought about by intransigent workers, many of whom were migrants from rural or semi-rural areas, whose formal education had been slight at best, and whose appreciation of the positive and progressive role of industrial capitalism was likely nil. Their refusal to be the mere stuff of barracks or factories was what shaped their commitment to the revolutionary program and what made them intolerable to the guardians of the state. The crises were both resolved in favor of states that could not coexist alongside such intransigence because their very purpose was to institute a form of hierarch hierarchical industrial modernity capable of surviving in a hostile and war-deformed world. In a process brilliantly described by Simon Pirani with regard to Russia, the organizations that had depended on working class self-activity, miracles of proletarian organization, as Lenin, as Lenin had put it, now called upon the working class only to participate as foot soldiers in com campaigns whose parameters were determined by the party and accorded with the demands of the state. A sad echo of this was to be seen in libertarian Barcelona, where the first show of anarchist strength following the May days was a gathering to witness the unveiling of a plaque commemorating 
the fallen martyr Bonaventura de Ruti. The same organizational higher-ups who had called on the workers to abandon the barricades and even enjoined the bereaved not to attend the funerals of fallen comrades now summoned the grassroots to a ceremony presided over not only the great and good of the anarchist movement, but alongside them at the platform, Ricardo Borillo, the communist chief of police, then spearheading operations against the revolutionary working class. So to conclude, it's possible to think of much of the history of revolutions as consisting of libertarian upsurges that are betrayed and suppressed by authoritarians. And clearly, we can find evidence to make this case in the history of the Spanish Revolution. However, I think a benefit of thinking about Kronstadt and the Barcelona May Days together is that it reveals a more complex problem. In both cases, the architects of the revolutionary situation had become entangled in the state and confronted the insurrections from the wrong side of the barricades. We perhaps need to think about why, in the case of the Spanish Revolution, libertarian ideology and organizations hadn't saved them from that faith. And thank you. Thanks very much, Danny, for um, the really interesting and um, instructive parallels that you draw between the, um, the processes of revolution and counter-revolution in the 1920s and the 1930s. And I was, I'm, I'm, left thinking about your final question, which is a really interesting one about, um, you know, the more complicated picture of revolution and that, 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 that you draw and the um, uh, <coughs> of the, <coughs> the uh, revolutionary forces in the state. So I think that's really interesting. Maybe that's something we can um, discuss in the, um, in the Q&A period. Our third speaker is George Katsiafikas. George has been active in social movements since the late 1960s and early 1970s, as he was a student of Herbert Marcusa, and he subsequently taught for many years at the Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston. He is the author of, among other works, The Subversion of Politics, European Autonomous Social Movements and the Decolonization of Everyday Life. The two volume, Asia's Unknown Uprisings and The Global Imagination of 1968, Revolution and Counter-Revolution, which was originally published, this is the copy I have, in 1987 and reissued by PM Press in 2018. George's work shows him, I think, to be a true friend of revolution. In research that is global in scope and rich in historical detail, he traces attempts made by human beings to leap beyond the dead weight of the past, the so-called survival of the fittest, and in so doing, he helps us to understand the many creative ways in which revolution was reimagined in the late 20th century, particularly in terms of what he characterizes here building on uh, Marcuse's work as the Eros effect. The title of George's presentation today is, quote, Enduring Problems of Communist Party's Suppression of popular movements. George. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, the suppression of the Kronstadt Commune led to the consolidation of power by the Bolsheviks. And it was, as the film yesterday graphically displayed, the main fighters of the revolution who were killed. And of course, this went on for decades with the children of the revolution uh, devouring the, their elders. So uh, the white army had been all but defeated even when uh, the Kronstadt commune was suppressed. This is clear. And I think it points to one of the enduring problems of uh, movements for freedom 
That is ultra sectarianism, where ideological differences are transformed into uh, people being made into enemies. And I think this is one of the lessons that we need to look at <clears throat> in terms of the uh, theoretical problematics of the aftermath of Kronstadt and what follows. What follows for Kronstadt, um, and I want to sort of divide it into the uh, how the how Lawrence uh, framed the beginning that there was a conception of history where the elite, the party, could take the lead, and a conception of history where people themselves directly could uh, push history in certain directions. The Bolsheviks, once they had consolidated power, continued to attempt uprisings led by the party. And even before they had consolidated power, you know, we had the uh, Soviet, the communist, German communist parties attacks on the Bavarian Soviet Republic, which uh, led to an end to the revolution there. We had a Republic of Councils in Hungary where people were in very close contact with Lenin in the Bolsheviks in the same year, in 1919. In 1920, there was the Bochum and Ruhr uprising in which the suppression of it, more than a thousand workers were killed. In Hamburg in 1923, uh, 24 police stations were simultaneously attacked under the leadership of the Communist Party. And again, the uprising was a failure. In uh, Nanjiang and Shanghai, China, with Russian insistence, the Chinese Communist Party and what was called the Lidisan Line of urban uprising, tens of thousands of people were killed, tens of thousands of activists were killed uh, in 1927. And you know, the, common, <clears throat> the common turn ordered a pullout of forces to Guangzhou in August 1927. Of course, this is a period in which Mao gets expelled from the Communist Party for insisting that the Russian strategy would not work in China, that what was needed was a peasant movement in the most remote areas of the country. And you know, the long march follows and a new strategy of communist revolutions emerges. I would just add as a second theoretical problematic here, that the uh, copycat theory of revolution has been thoroughly discredited. So the Russian model of urban uprising being copied or compelled to be copied by the Russian common turn onto China was an absolute failure. Similarly, the Chinese concept of human wave assault in the final uh, victory was forced onto the Vietnamese at the end Bien Phu. Now let's just recall very quickly that uh, the Dien Bien Phu was a major victory for Vietnam and defeat of imperialism, Western imperialism, French imperialism in particular, but it really was predicated upon artillery ringing the mountain around a very remote valley. That artillery, believe it or not, came from North Korea. It was a uh, captured American artillery that was transported through China and brought to Vietnam. And I don't know if you've ever seen the footage, it's astonishing footage of thousands of Vietnamese pulling artillery pieces up these muddy hills, sliding back down, starting up again, sliding down. But a monumental effort to create a victorious uh, end to French occupation of Indochina, that communist solidarity, international communist solidarity made possible. And yet, the Chinese insistence upon human waves, Ho Chi Minh and No Vin Jiap said, wait a minute, this is costing us too many lives of our people. And instead, they insisted upon trench warfare, where they simply dug. And in the same way that the Chinese revolution had let's say, emphasize slowly building up uh, in rural areas and attacking the main centers of power. The Vietnamese then said, well, we are going to do this in a tactical fashion on the battlefield. And they had to 
reject the Chinese advisors and what they were saying at that time. So uh, continuing then with the uh, theoretical problematics that Kronstadt and subsequent history make clear is uh, one is substitution of the party for the proletariat. In other words, once uh, in the philosophy of uh, historical materialism, the proletariat as the driving force of history uh, is replaced in fact, not in theory, but in fact by the party. And this, of course, uh, involves a reification or commodification of the conscious element, the party as the conscious element. If you know then and what is to be done, uh, the party, the centralized, secretive, party, which was necessitated by the conditions in Tsarist Russia uh, in that period, 1901, when he wrote it. But it also involves a dishonoring of spontaneity, of popular movements that emerge, uh, let's say, without the party's approval and leadership. And of course, to me, one of the main lessons of the 20th century in terms of revolutionary strategy is that spontaneity should be honored, that people's uprising should be respected, that we can learn from uh, what people regard as freedom. Whatever people are willing to risk their lives for in struggles against governments indicates the meaning of freedom at that moment in history. And of course, um, it's very clear that uh, the, the Bolsheviks transformed their entire philosophy from a revolutionary theory into one of instrumental ruling, that their, you know, their domination of the society led to various theoretical adjustments as well as practical ones. The net result of all of this are uprisings within Soviet regimes. And these are, uh, I can, you know, I'll, list, I'll give a list. Javier might be showing slides, but East Germany in June 1953, in more than 400 cities and towns, there was an uprising, a workers' uprising against the Soviet regime. Hungary, three years later, October to November 1956, uh, particularly bloody uprising, uh, communist being lynched on lampposts and uh, over 3,000 people killed in the fighting. Tibet, three years later, 1959, an enormous uprising, which uh, is relatively unknown. I, I write about it in uh, Asia's Unknown Uprising. And then I think, to me, what is the most emblematic uh, uprising against Soviets was the Czechoslovak uprising in 1968 where actually, believe it or not, uh, the Czechoslovakian Communist Party under the leadership of Alexander Dubček talked about creating socialism with a human faith, socialism and democracy, socialism where the people had their say. And the whole party moved ahead. And of course that was answered in August by the invasion of Czechoslovakia by more than half a million Russian troops, tanks, et cetera. And fighting was much more widespread than has been previously revealed. Uh, you know, we've spent some time today talking about, or yesterday and today, how Soviet history uh, has a particular version of events. I think if I could say so that pacifist history has a certain uh, re revision of historical events of uprising. For instance, the Philippines uprising of 1986 that overthrew Marcos, long, long entrenched dictator Marcos, the key element was the army. And the army, the key moment was when the army attacked the government TV station and the Air Force attacked the presidential palace, physically attacked, killing people. And, you know, this is something covered up by the role of the Catholic Church and the so called, uh, you know, uh, pacifist version. But in Czechoslovakia, for instance, so widespread was the support for the revolution that it took the Russians a week to find the post office. 
No one would tell them where it was. People took down the street signs. And when the Communist Party was debating whether or not to fight the Russians or not, they actually were able to persuade thousands of steel workers at the largest steel factory in Czechoslovakia to switch badges with, with them. And so the Communist Party delegates were able to meet in what the Russians thought was a meeting of the union of the steel workers to increase production, when actually it was the Czechs talking about whether to fight the Russians or not. And of course, they decided not to. But um, quite an amazing movement that I think uh, really merits further investigation. Yugoslavia in the same year, there was a student uprising. Tito met with the students personally. Poland two years later, 1970, as well as 76 and 80, and of course, China in 1989. Uh, well, Tibet as well in 89, but these are all uprisings within Soviet regimes. What we could say the proletariat versus the dictatorship of the proletariat. And the phenomenal form of the proletarian mass, as Rosa Luxemburg likes to say, is I think what we need to look at in this period and beyond this period, because beyond this period, we have uprisings that in some ways, I think we could almost say are spontaneously the third revolution. They occur outside traditional parties. They do not occur with the leadership of communist parties. May 68 in France or the, the US new left from uh, in 1970, beginning with the Cambodian invasion, ending with the Black Panther Party's uh, Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention, where the movement went far beyond the Panther Party's platform. Uh, Italy in 1977, where the Communist Party actually sided with the police and brought thugs into the university to attack striking students. In fact, the communists and their thugs were evicted from the universities by the students in heavy fighting and then supported the uh, Carbonieri when they came back to take the university. Uh, in 1986 in the Philippines, in an uprising I mentioned earlier, the Philippine Communist Party simply sat on the sidelines in their guerrilla bases and refused to take part in this movement that they said is a spontaneous movement and will lead nowhere. So more recent instances of what I'm calling, uh, following Luxembourg, the phenomenal form of people's movement. And thank you for mentioning the Eros effect, but basically the 1960s, uh, the, my book in 87, which covered 27 countries, described the movement as a global movement, as a unified global movement. Uh, and the subsequent re-edition has 53 countries, so it's quite expanded and has different endings. Uh, the original book is available online at my website, if anybody uh, ha wants to have a look. But the 60s wave, world historical wave, ushered in a period in world history where about every 10 years, there has been another wave of revolutions, just very quickly. In 1980, the disarmament movement, which led to uh, an end to medium range nuclear missiles for a time, but also convinced Gorbachev that he didn't need to keep the East European buffer states to prevent a third German invasion of uh, Russia in the 20th century. The Asian wave from 1986 to 1992, which overthrew eight dictatorships in nine places in a region with five major religions and seven main languages. Uh, this is an unknown wave. And I, as I say, uh, believe this is again, a global wave or a regional wave. The Asian wave leads to the support of the wave in the Soviet region right, where seven countries plus the Soviet Union have their regimes overthrown uh, by popular rising. The next wave is the alter globalization wave, which, you know, we can start, I think, with the Zapatista uprising in 1994, 
tracing it through uh, Seattle in 1999, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO confrontations, and then in February 15, 2003, without centralized organization, 30 million people simultaneously go into the streets against the new Iraq war, which hadn't even started. And you know, this is tremendous synchronization from the grassroots and uprising. So 10 years later, in 2011, we have the Arab Spring. Uh, in 14 months, 14 countries experienced uprising. Uh, this is the same year in which Occupy Wall Street, the Greek squares movement, the Spanish squares movement occurs. And then, of course, in 2020, the Black Lives Matter, as we can call the Black Lives Matter uprising, which was international in scope and continues, for instance, in Greece today. Even though it's not Black Lives Matter, it's an anti-police, uh, anti-repression movement that continues. So the phenomenal form of the proletarian mass is now global. And its grammar is that it's not tied to a particular party, that it's based on direct democracy that there's international solidarity, self-organization, and reaches its highest point in communes. By communes, I mean gatherings, such as the Sorbonne in 1968, which became an open forum for workers, students, everybody, as uh, Taksim Square in Turkey, uh, Tahrir Square in, uh, in Egypt, uh, the Democracy Square in Kwangju where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in 1980 in an uprising I compare to the Paris Commune of uh, 1871, uh, you know, first they defeated the military without a pre-existing army. The Paris Commune had a pre-existing French National Guard that seized power. In Kwangju, the military attacked the city because people remained in the streets for democracy. People spontaneously defeated the crack troops of the South Korean army, paratroopers pulled off the front lines of North Korea, you know, with North Korea. And people defeated them, savage fighting. The paratroopers raped, pillaged, killed taxi drivers, uh, uh, tortured the chief of police of Kwangju, arrested the local military commander of, of the region. And nonetheless, people defeated the military. And, and then as fighting continued for five days, made their decisions in circles at what became known as Democracy Square with sometimes 150,000 people uh, and as no less than 30,000 people in democratic decision making. And you know, this uprising is truly remarkable, much more uh, democratic, direct democratic, but the direct democracy, this component of the phenomenal form is uh, very much activated around the world today. Just to give you latest examples, if you look at the Sudan and if you look at uh, Algeria, the uh, movements there were based upon a kind of open assembly that produced leadership that came out of these open assemblies. And we could talk about, you know, are, is this the working class? What is the proletariat? As Marcuse said, the revolutionary subject emerges in the course of revolution. And in the course of these Asian uprisings and these African uprisings of recent days, the leadership groups have been often from, drawn from professionals, uh, doctors, lawyers, journalists, professors, nurses. Uh, these have been the, the folks who have provided the uh, leadership of movements by popular acclaim, popularly chosen. So I will, I will stop there. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, George, for um, helping, among other things, to uh, illuminate one of the more disturbing aspects of the legacy of Kronstadt, the suppression of, um, of, uh, of, of spontaneous popular uprisings by the communist parties and for suggesting uh, one important way in which the cycle of revolutionary betrayal, as it were, that has repeated itself throughout the 20th century might be broken.
Our final speaker is Dmitry Bukenkow. Dmitry is a Russian political migrant who worked from 2009 to 2017 as an associate professor in the Department of Social and Humanitarian Sciences at the Pirogov Russian National Research Medical University. He's currently, uh, and currently an independent researcher. Uh, Dmitry is the author of Anarchists in Russia at the end of the 20th century and the political ideology of Russian leftists at the turn of the 20th and 21st century. Dmitry's presentation today entitled The Problem of Power in the Anarchist Worldview has been pre-recorded and uh, I'm hoping this will work, uh, will now be delivered uh, via video link. I met with Vizio especially for the conference Kronstadt as a revolutionary utopia. I thank the organizers of the conference for the opportunity to participate. The subject of my report is the problem of power in the anarchist world view. The Kronstadt rebellion in 1921 to place under 1921, to place uh, insurgent sailors, did not place uh, insurgent sailors, demanded by the Soviets be freed from the domain of the, the relationship of anarchism to power remained open. And this was and still is a serious dilemma what I am going to talk about. It is believed what anarchism generally denies power, anarchism generally, which means what we are is not problem of power in the anarchism. But in my opinion, it is a gross oversimplification. The best confirmation of that is the revolution in Spain in 1936. For anarchists, the members of the CNT, members of the FAI, joined members of the government in November 1936. The anarcho syndicalist Juan Lopez was the Minister of Commerce. The anarcho syndicalist Juan Pero was the Minister of Industry. The anarcho syndicalist Frederica Monsigny was the Minister of Health, and Garcia Oliver was the Minister of Justice. The question is why did this happen? In my opinion, this is not an accident. This is the result of the flaw in anarchism on the issue of power. The anarchists who entered the Spanish government in 1936 were not the ordinary members of the anarchist monument. For example, Garcia Oliver was a revolutionary with a lot of experience. I am sure what uh, if anarchists ever prevail in politics uh, in any country, uh, we will inevitably face the same dilemma. Uh, what faced the anarchists in Spain uh, or the anarchists in Russia in Revolution 1917. It is a dilemma that cannot be simply discarded or pretended not to exist. I put the dilemma in this way. When anarchists dominance in politics, we are forced to use power to consolidate their dominant position. A society without power can exist only if it's supported by power. For self-organization to work, someone has to organize it. If anarchists do not try to legitimize where influence, where are perceived simply as criminals, even if we act unselfishly. In the theory of anarchism itself, uh, where we attempts to solve the power dilemma, but we 
have failed so far. Let's take, for example, the book of Russian and his philosopher, Alexei Baravoy, a contemporary of the Kronstadt Rebellion. The book is called The Power. Alexei Baravoy understood the complexity of the dilemma. In his book, he writes what power does not end uh, with the equations of the state. Alexei Baravoy believed what power for anarchism is not rooted in the biological properties of a person. Power, he believed, is not a biological, but a social phenomenon. The dilemma of power, Baravoy believes, lays in the antagonism of the individual and society. Baravoy's merit is what he went further when the classical anarchism of Kropotkin. Uh, yet he still did not solve the power dilemma. His book ends with abstract declarations. Alexei Baravoy does not give a clear answer to the questions. How power arises, how it can be destroyed, and if the power can be destroyed, when how to destroy it. Another example of the anarchism relation to power can be taken from the theory of anarchism of the 21st century, from the book of Saul Newman, in his book From Bakunin to Lacan, anti authoritarianism and the dislocation of power. Saul Newman names his views post anarchism. Saul Newman takes as a basis the views of postmodern philosophers, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Gilles Deleuze, and so on. So Newman suggests looking for power in the structures of language and thought. But I disagree with him. The solution to the problem of power remains outside of the scope of the speculative philosophy. Post-anarchism does not analyze real state or real power relations in society. Post-anarchism does not provide answers to those questions. In the article, The Politic of Post-anarchism, so Newman writes what post-anarchism presupposes an empty and indefinite radical horizon. In my opinion, post-anarchism depends the crisis of the left and does not give any way out. There are many different theories of power in modern political science. I'd like to draw your attention to one article, Two Faces of Power, published in 1962 by Peter Bachrach and Morton Barrett. The authors of this article have hardly read Alexei Baraoy, but we repeat his idea what power is dual in nature. We wrote about two types of power, political power and social power. The political power is the elitist, alienated power of the ruling class. The social power is the one what regulates social relations without direct violence and the intervention of repressive structures. For example, the power of parents or children, the power of traditions, and so on. Alexei Baravoy advocates the elimination of those above types of power. In my opinion, this is a mistake. The abolishing of social power results in destruction of society. Power can be made in egalitarian, inalienable from people. Alexei Baravoy wrote what power is not biological, but social. But the fact is that the biological nature of people is initially social in its foundation. In modern social psychology, where its point of view what power arises in small social groups 
in the mazes of social statuses, hunter goers have no classes, no state, but they do have difference in status. The formation of statuses within even small social groups is inevitable, which means what the formation of power is inevitable. Wherefore, it is impossible to liquidate the power altogether. There is no need to fall into pessimism. This does not mean what self-organization is impossible. A society without a state is another non-state form of power. Conclusions. The anarchists of Russia tried to analyze the reasons for the defeat of the Mahvist monument. We concluded what we like it organization. It is no what the Mahnovis in exile released the platform, which split the anarchists of the time into two camps. In the 1950s, Georges Fontenay tried to develop the idea of the platform. In my opinion, the platform is the past history of anarchism. The Mahno Arshinov's platform cannot simply be taken and put into use. The platform cannot be released in modern society if its ideas are taken literally. The anarchists of Spain also tried to analyze the reasons of their defeat. In past Abel book, Dorothy in Spanish Revolution, we can find attempts of some analysis. Pas Abel quotes the opinion of the FAI leader Garcia Oliver. Garcia Oliver wrote, there was no need to be ashamed of the price seizure of power. The CNT was supposed to seize power, but organize it in other non-state forms. The sailors of Kronstadt opposed the usurpation of the Soviets by Bolsheviks. From the military point of view, the sailors in Kronstadt had no chance to defeat Bolshevism. But the idea of non-state socialism is still alive and uh, will still live for a long time. This idea has a chance of revival if the mistakes of the past are taken into account. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, for broaching such an important, if I think very controversial um, uh, topic. We'll see whether this generates some questions um, in, the, in the chat. Um, what we're gonna do now is move to the question and answer period. Um, and here I'm going to, um, I'm being sent some of the questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna scroll up and I'll be selective um, in the questions because there's quite a number of them that are listed here. I'm gonna start with a question for, um, for Mike, for Mike Harris. Um, and the question is this, I appreciated uh, your emphasis on the socialization of housing. The equalization of housing would be such a visible material demonstration of social equality. I've been struck in trips to Cuba by the extreme inequality in this area, the equalization of housing. Do you know of any place where this has been more handled more fairly or addressed? I do not. Um, many of the uh, attempts by the uh, Stalinist socialists have simply failed at, at equalization. Uh, the socialization by the uh, Russian people and 1917-1920 uh, period uh, seem to have been uh, much more grassroots, much more oriented towards those who actually lived in the uh, particular uh, communities and houses and homes themselves. The others seem to be uh, more uh, top-down and uh, attempts just to build building blocks without any sort of equalization or socialization of the, uh, so to speak, the means of production, but that of the means of housing. Thank you, Mike. Um, 
We have a question here for um, for Danny. Um, Danny, why did the anarchists? It's a big question. Why did the anarchists lose in Spain? What do you think about it? Do you want to unmute there, Danny? Um, what well, probably? It's a big, it's a big question. Um, I, I suppose there are lots of different ways of answering the question, really. Um, like the, the anarchists lost in different ways, I suppose you could say. Um, partly, like the, the anarchist project was was undermined by um, or by, by anarchist organisations themselves um, collaborating with uh, the republican state. Um, the process of the revolution um, went on in a sort of parallel, uh, in parallel to the decomposition of the, the republican state in the wake of the military rising in the country. Um, the uh, an, like anarchists' collaboration with the republican uh, republican state allowed that state to re-establish itself. And of course, it, you know, insofar as it re-established itself, it pushed back against the um, revolutionary achievements of largely anarchist, not entirely anarchist, um, workers and peasants. Um, so that's one way in which the anarchists lost. And um, well, I mean, another way is that the the war was lost. You know, the, the war as a whole, um, the, the anarchists were fighting alongside other anti-fascist forces. Was was lost um, against uh, Franco. So, I mean, there there are minimum two defeats um, that the anarchists suffer in, in the Spanish Civil War, but possibly more. You know, I think it's it's a complex question um, having to do with like in, internal factors and also factors that would be on the control of the anarchists. I mean, I think it's just it's just too big a subject, really, to try and answer in a pithy kind of way. So I apologise to the the questioner, um, but it's you know that's a good question to like do more research into to Spain about you know. Thanks very much, Danny. Um, I don't know if um, George is on the call um, at the moment. George, are you are you are you hearing this at the moment? Yes, I'm here. I'm okay. here. Excellent. Um, there's a question for you. Um, I'd like to hear you elaborate more on what you mean by spontaneity. Is it just about being outside a party framework, in your view? Well, no, because parties can be involved in spontaneous uprisings. Uh, a good example for me is uh, Nepal in 20, 2006 where the monarchy was finally abolished. I mean, previous uprising had made it a constitutional monarchy. 2006, <clears throat> there were 11 communist parties in Nepal that were involved in the people's uprising, uh, Jana Andalan II, uh, as it was called. Uh, and of course, the biggest of them was the Maoist, you know, Communist Party of Nepal Maoist, which uh, had an enormous uh, armed struggle in the countryside that coordinated with the urban uprising in the city. I mean, the, you know, Nepal is vertically, horizontally quite diverse in terms of ethnic and regional and linguistic differences. So parties were definitely involved in what became the largest movement in the country's history, in fact, which defined the identity of the country. So I think the main characteristic of what I mean by spontaneous is in most countries, hundreds of thousands or millions of people simultaneously going into the streets of their own accord, not being called by a central committee, uh, not being called by uh, outside, let's say heteronymously, but autonomously deciding. For instance, let me give you an example today. There are more people against global capitalism than ever before in history. Spontaneously, what, what am I saying? I'm saying nobody told people to be against global capitalism. There was no central committee that said, let's be against global capitalism. And the Zapatistas 
uprising in 94 signaled it as the target, neoliberalism as the target. But the fact that all over the world, people have come to, uh, let's say, spontaneously oppose capitalism, oppose patriarchy. Uh, you know, the, the, this is, there's a strong relationship with parties, with, but the, main, the driving force of history are the people themselves. I don't know if that answers the question. It's a longer discussion, but. Thanks very much. Did, did anybody else want to come in on that or shall I move on to the next? Um, I'll move on to the next question here. I'm just going to ask for um, Irina's help uh, in the, um, the translation. Um, uh, so we have a question for Dimitri and the question is, do you think the anarchist reluctance to acknowledge persistent problems of social power help explain the tendency of anarchist communities of resistance to collapse into infighting? Dimitri, <laughs> объяснить следующее. Считаете ли вы, что нежелание анархистов решать проблемы, которые довольно насущные и связаны с социальной властью, помогают объяснить то, что анархические сообщества сопротивления проигрывают в соперничестве и в каких-то краткосрочных конфликтах в ближнем бою? Да, мне понятен вопрос. Я считаю, то, что одна из причин, почему анархисты все время проигрывают, будьте добры. Uh, uh, yes, Дмитрий speaking. One of the causes why uh, anarchists are constantly lose or collapse in, in fighting. Uh, это действительно нежелание uh, понять и проанализировать вопрос о власти. Во всяком случае, как показывает историческая практика, когда, например, Анархисты в революции 17 -го года, некоторые вдруг оказывались uh, председатель, председателями Совета. Оказывалось то, что они не знали, что сделать и как себя вести при it, этом. It was just because they did not know what to do and how to behave in those situations. Uh, например, в, Тверско в Тверской uh, области в 18 году. Uh, uh -huh. uh, for example, in the Tverskaya region in, in 1918. 1900, да. Uh, и uh, до тех пор, пока uh, не будет uh, внятного, uh, внятного ответа на этот вопрос, uh, анархисты в любой революции, как, ну, это мое личное мнение, будут uh, вставать передо мной тоже дилеммой власти. They will have the comprehensible answer to the question of power. И, и как, как мне кажется, ключ, возможный ключ к разрешению этой дилеммы, это вот как раз вот эта теория социальной власти. And the theory of social power, I think, and it's my opinion, I'm, I'm speaking uh, on the behalf of Dmitry, Uh, will be the uh, key answer, the key method to, to find the, the, the answer. Mm -hmm. Спасибо за вопрос. And thank you for the question. Спасибо. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to a question from, um, and this is a question for uh, 
to all the panel, it arises, I think, in part from something that, uh, that George was saying in his presentation at the very start about uh, uh, sectarianism. And the question to all the panel is um, great discussion. My question is, how do we challenge ultra sectarianism in our movements? Any practical suggestions for an anarchist comrade in Dublin? Does anybody, anybody want to take up that, uh, that important question? I'll take a shot. Okay, Mike. Yeah, well, we shouldn't practice it at all. We should figure out ways to uh, minimize the disagreements and work together where we can. And, and it really comes down to just the willingness of people to, to put aside certain differences. There will be tactical differences. There'll be strategic differences. There'll be organiza organizational differences. However, we can segment certain elements of things, work together where we can, stay independent where we need to, and just try and be comradely. Try and be decent individuals in terms of the way we deal with those who we may have extreme uh, disagreements or minor disagreements. So that's a way to minimize sectarianism. And of course, if anybody has organizational chauvinism, as they say, it's kind of hard to beat that, but you try to have to downplay uh, that you have the correct answer to every question and that your organization and your organization alone is, uh, the, is uh, the premier organization, so to speak. Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, did anybody else want to come in on that point? Uh, George, I think, or am I? Yes, uh, I would like to say, I think, uh, look, look, let's look, take Kronstadt as an example. They were the sailors, the thousands of sailors in Kronstadt were clearly some of the hardest fighters of the revolution. And yet the Bolsheviks marched against them. How could they be vilified first by turning them into allies of the whites? That should have been challenged immediately with it by honest Bolsheviks who knew better. Or were the Bolsheviks so deluded in their thinking, so inured by the horrors of the Civil War that they really believed it? I think we need to challenge people when they say, for instance, as was said yesterday, that Counterpunch and Forrest Tucker, whatever his name is, are similar. You know, or uh, these, these ultra sectarian characterizations need to be challenged before they can take root and grow into violent outcomes. Because let's face it, violence is not something that revolutions uh, can do without. Revolutions are violent events by their nature. Is there such a thing as a nonviolent revolution? Ideally, there should be, but it's, I'm just afraid that we are opening ourselves to be massacred if we believe that. So why do certain groups attack certain others? Why, you know, how could the Cheka go to execute hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of Russians because they get characterized in ways that are not. So the way I think the principal way is to challenge people when they dehumanize others uh, within the movement. Thank you for that. Um, just to note um, for those who among you who are very, very time conscious to note that we have until it's the schedule is slightly amended in this regard. I've been told by the conference organizers the film, the next film that follows this won't start until 6.45. So we have some time um, to continue the, uh, the Q&A. And I just like to uh, pose <clears throat> another question to all the panel. Uh, and this question, anybody who'd like to take this one up, another very large question, but important question. How do insurrections and uprisings turn into lasting revolutions? That the organs of popular power, the organs of dual power need to be continually strengthened. People need to have a commitment to them over many years. For instance, in Kwangju, the demands that uh, emerged at the, at the meeting of 150,000 people, 
a, a third of the people said we should surrender. What are we, we're crazy. What have we done? We've killed soldiers. We've armed ourselves. They're going to come in and kill us all. But the majority said no. They attacked us. We defended ourselves. We rid them. And we should, one, get an apology and a promise that this you know, will be corrected to know who is responsible for the violence and have them punished. And three, have restitution for the victims. It took the people of Gwangju 20 years for that to happen, 20 years or more. It's still going on. They still have not determined who gave the order to fire. You know, when the military opened fire on unarmed people, that's after that that people armed themselves and defeated the military. But 20 years of a massive struggle that involved, you know, so many different uh, twists and turns. And somehow the organs of popular power in the YMCA, in the churches, in the universities, in, within the main institutions, continue to function. You know, so it's like to us, the YMCA, what are you talking about? That was formed to combat the Red Menace, right, originally. Uh, but yet in South Korea, it became a place, a center of the struggle, and still is. If you want to, you know, if you ever want to go to Gwangju, go to the YMCA and try to meet people there. I mean, now there's the May 18th Institute, there's the May 18th Foundation, but uh, so I would just say organs of popular power continually need to be renewed. We need to devote ourselves in a non-sectarian fashion so that all of us with organized organizing skills shouldn't just stay home, we should be in the street talking, arguing for what, you know, what is appropriate. And of course, I hate to say it, but one of the lessons of Kwangju is that the organizers had all left the city or were arrested. And it was people themselves who committed to continuing the struggle. I mean, okay. I'll let somebody else have a moment. Thanks very much. Did, did anybody else want to come in on that point? We have quite a number of other questions, but if anybody else wanted to come in on that, Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Um, this is a question for whichever panelist would like to take it. Were the protests in the summer of 2020 sparked by the murder of George Floyd part of a spontaneous uprising in the sense that we are discussing? Accumulation, I mean, uh, 2020 was accumulation of many years of uh, Injustice is done, and uh, you know. Insert. I just want to get back to this question, though. In some ways, of spontaneity and inter and insurrection. Insur you know, anything that's successful takes years and years of organizing. Okay, Spain, although a failure to our movement, took almost a hundred years of organizing. So the question then becomes: I think you know, there's there's spontaneous moments. And then there are all those other years where people are organizing, where multiple organizational efforts are being made in different fronts. Uh, insurrections themselves, I mean, they could be a momentary thing, they can be isolated, or they can be popular. But again, a momentary thing, but the question of organization going forward, popular organization, is really the key, in my opinion, uh, to anything that may be successful down the road. So are you, in effect, you're calling into question this sort of dichotomy between organization and spontaneity? Is that the sort of... They both happen. No, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't think anything is black and white. And I think we're gonna have lots of gray areas. I think we're gonna have a lot of moments of sparks and fire and some success and some failure. So no, I, I don't. And I won't put, you know, no, no I don't. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. There was a, just as an aside on this point, that, that an interesting pamphlet by Murray Bookchin from the sixties on spontaneity and organization and the mm -hmm. debate between Bookchin and um, um, and some of his critics on, 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 on that point. Um, I wanna move on. There's um, a question for, um, another question for Dimitri. Um, regarding, Dimitri, regarding your rejection of the platform, uh, the, the, the 
the person writes, I'll observe that you offered no companion or counter theory. What would that look like? What, so what would a uh, counter theory to the platform look like? Uh, Dmitry, вопрос mm -hmm. к вам такой. Вы uh, отвергаете идею платформы, uh, но какой-то uh, другой теории вы не предлагаете. А как, какая бы теория подошла бы в этом случае? Какая-то контртеория? Uh, я, я немножко не так сказал. Я не отвергаю на 100% идею платформы. There was no rejection, 100% rejection of the idea of platform. Uh, no, uh, platform, uh, 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 я uh, не думаю, что я готов вам сейчас дать прямо сейчас развернутый ответ, uh, какая бы идея подошла. Тем более то, что uh, мы живем он, в разных странах и в разных в каждой стране может своя, быть своя собственная ситуация. And taking the account that we are living in very different countries and the situation in our countries can be very different. Uh, no, no, при этом uh, главная идея платформы, она uh, является бесспорной. But the, uh, the main idea of the platform is unobjectable. Uh, idea, idea, как я uh, ее понимаю, в следующем. And the idea, as I interpret the idea, is as follows. Необходима слаженная организация. The organization, the coordinated organization is required. Которая состоит из людей, имеющих достаточно длительный опыт. And this organization should be formed of people with... Uh, Significant experience. Uh, я могу привести здесь личный пример. And I can give you a personal example here. Uh, так получилось то, что uh, я присутствовал, был наблюдателем uh, событиям, событий на Майдане uh, революции в Украине в весной 2014 года. Uh, I attended, I observed the events on uh, Maidan in Ukraine in 2014. Uh, может быть, вы знаете, And maybe you know that all the processes were controlled on the Maidan, but ultra-right nationalists of Ukraine. Но при этом все знали то, что на выходе из метро была палатка профсоюзов, где концентрировались левые, в том числе и анархисты. Uh, и одна из причин, uh, почему, как я считаю, uh, левые и анархисты в этой палатке даже не смогли uh, поднять открыто свою символику, символику своих коммунистических uh, или анархистских организаций в следующем. And I think the main reason why the leftists, the anarchists, could not even show and demonstrate their symbolics openly is as follows. То, что в отличие от ультраправых, которые контролировали Майдан, is that uh, to the opposite uh, to the ultra rightist who controlled the Maidan. За, за многие годы до этого анархисты в Украине занимались чем угодно, только не не uh, 
подготовкой к таким возможным событиям, в отличие от ультраправых, которые занимались этим годами, и у них были организации. So, uh, the uh, ultra righties were organized and have, uh, have had the organizations and had a lot of experience before Maidan and anarchists did many different things, but not the organizational things. They were not organized. Uh, and... Ну, думаю, что достаточно. Думаю, что в этом вопрос. Ответ. Uh, well, Спасибо.